Good morning, everyone. Today I'm here at Oakwood Cemetery, and I want to go ahead and give you a quick tour of the overall cemetery in all of its sections, starting here from Section A. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the cemetery itself. The cemetery was founded in the 1850s as a replacement for Shaco Hill Cemetery further up into Richmond and was designed in a similar manner to how Hollywood Cemetery would be designed. And there are actually plans of what the original design of the original Oakwood Cemetery would have looked like, but as you can tell, uh, it's definitely not followed that entire plan in its entirety. And the reason why has to start with, well, the first and most important factor here, and that is the American Civil War erupted in 1861. And as a result, with men, of course, dying as a result of war, they needed to be buried somewhere. And one of these choice cemeteries was this newly founded cemetery that they had here in Richmond, Virginia, Oakwood Cemetery. So first, I'll cover each section individually and discuss and discuss their different implications and their different designs, as well as some of the unique features and when they were originally utilized. We'll first begin our little guide here at Section A of the cemetery. Section A, as the uh, letter suggests, is the first section here in the cemetery. And the reason why is because this is the first section of the cemetery to have been utilized by the newly founded Confederate government in 1861 to begin the burials here. A lot of the graves in this section are 1861 burials, including those over there all along this back row, all the way towards the end, as well as some over here in this section. But there are also a lot of 1862 burials, but they're all early date burials. Now, one of the unique features, and along with many other features of this section, is these wagon roads, which were later converted into proper pathways for walking around in the cemetery. And the reason why these existed was because early on in the war, there weren't that many deaths occurring, and the war was thought to be going to go by fairly quickly. However, that didn't turn out to be the case. But instead of changing the entire plan here, they decided to keep these wagon paths through here because it helped get the bodies into the cemetery and fairly close to where they needed to be buried. Later on, though, this would change with section B, C, and in the other sections further to the back. The other unique feature of this section is the main Confederate monument over there, which I will give you a close up in a couple seconds. As well as this entire flagpole here, and well, the general fact that this entire section is a little bit more developed compared to the other sections. Sorry about that there. <laughs> yeah, buses, I tell you. So, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of a close-up of the monument over there, and then I'm going to go ahead and go to the next section. And here in Section A, we have the Confederate monument dedicated to the 16,000 men buried here at the cemetery. This monument is one of the earliest Confederate monuments to have been built, being erected and dedicated on May 10th, 1866. <sighs> And on this side, you have, in memory of the 16,000 Confederate soldiers from 13 states erected by the Ladies Oakwood Memorial Association Organization, May 10th, 1866. And as we go along around the side, we will see that there's a little bit more than just that written on there. On this side, we have Maryland, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas written on the, if I recall correctly, the northern side of the monument. If I got that wrong, sue me. But there's a little bit more as we go around towards 
the western side of this monument. You have Texas, Kentucky, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana written on this side of the monument. And then finally on the southern side of the monument, if I am correct, we have this little epitaph at the end. The epitaph of the soldier who falls with his country is written in the hearts of those who love the right and honor the brave. A touching little sentiment that we all hopefully can agree to. Now we carry on to section B. Here we are in section B of the cemetery, which is adjacent to section A and is just a little bit downhill from the main Confederate monument up there. And as you can see, as we pan around over here, as slowly as I can, we see there's a dramatic difference between this section and section A up there. Now, the reason for that is quite simple. The nature of the entire war had changed between the early parts of 1861 and early 1862 to a far more bloody and dangerous affair. What ended up happening was that, especially after the Peninsula Campaign had begun, there were more casualties coming here to Richmond, especially to the hospitals, and as a result, the hospitals saw a massive influx of men who were coming in here to be healed, to be treated for their wounds, and many of them unfortunately didn't make it. This is especially the case around the later part, the latter parts of the Peninsula Campaign around May of 1862, where we then have one of the bloody, one of the bloodiest battles of the war at that point, the Battle of Seven Pines, which a number of men here buried in this section were wounded at Seven Pines, and then later on were treated here in Richmond, but unfortunately didn't recover fully. And one of those men is actually right just over here, so past the grave of John W. Pennington and Samuel A. Daniels, we reach this humble tombstone of Robert B. Hardesty, who was wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines and then later treated here in Richmond, Virginia, only to later on pass away. And then the tall obelisk, which is the only obelisk in the entire Confederate section outside of the main Confederate monument, we have the grave of another man who died at the Battle of Seven Pines, and that would be the bat that would be to one private likes of the second Florida infantry. As we get a little bit closer here, I want to tell you a little bit more about this entire section. This section also may include a number of men from later on during the early parts of the Seven Days campaigns the Seven Days Battles, I should say, where a large number of men would later on be wounded and then brought here to Richmond to be healed. And unfortunately, many of them ended up dying regardless. And as you can see here, this section isn't really the most specta you know, spectacular section, but it does have a bit of history overall. Now, we'll head on to section C. And here we are at section C of Oakwood Cemetery, which is adjacent to section B and has a little bit of a overlap between the two. Both sections of, both section B and C of Oakwood Cemetery here cover roughly around the same time period, the, la the latter parts of the Peninsula Campaign, and of course, the Seven Days Battles. And as you can see here, we're just only a short distance away from Section B. Section C contains a lot more dead from the Seven Days Battles, especially from the Battle of Gaines Mill. A large number of the men who died here, who were wounded and then eventually died in Richmond's hospitals were wounded predominantly at the Battle of Gaines Mill, which was one of both one of the costliest battles of the war and also saw one of the largest charges of the entire war, where 
some 55,000 men or so charged the Union positions across Boatswain Creek and up to tur up Turkey Hill and were able to drive away the Federal Corps, I believe, if I recall correctly, the Fifth Corps under Porter. Now, that charge, though, was quite costly and resulted in quite a large number of men dead or wounded or missing. And many of those wounded would eventually end up here in Section C. And in fact, there's a couple of other important things that have happened here later on in the war, which I will cover quite shortly. At the end of the war, Section C would actually attract the attention of one famous photography team under Andrew Gardner's control, namely that of John Rikis, who had done a number of photographs up in the entire area around Gaines Mill and Cold Harbor, covering the sites around that area, particularly the entire burial teams that were going around and collecting up the dead, as well as some of the famous points around there. However, sometime around April or May 1865, Jean Riquis would come here to this cemetery and would end up taking a photograph at this exact spot, showing off a number of the graves of men who were wounded here, who were wounded at Gaines Mill and then eventually buried here at Oakwood Cemetery. And as you can see, much of the original sight line has been preserved over the years, just generally due to a lack of major erosion going on here. However, a lot of the original wooden signs have since decayed away, and all you have now left are these simple marble markers that would mark the different plots. And some of the men who were wounded and ended up dying who ended up dying as a result of the Battle of Gaines Mill are men like George Doss, who actually features in that photograph, as well as a large number of men from the 4th Texas, such as Albert Polk Brown, John T. Young, and a number of others, which I have actually covered them in a couple of other videos previously. So now we'll continue on to Section D of the cemetery. And here we are at Section D of the cemetery. Now, Section D shows another change in the overall war itself. This section, along with the furthest section away from here over there on that knoll, Section E, contained predominantly 1863 burials, if not entirely 1863 burials. And as you can see here, there's a market change in the war where there aren't as many casualties occurring here in Richmond and that all has to do with the fact that most of the war has moved further north towards Fredericksburg towards Chancellorsville and then eventually with the 1863 northern the northern campaign of Robert E. Lee which leads to the Battle of Gettysburg as a result not as many men from the Army of Northern Virginia end up in the hospitals here in Richmond and as a result, there aren't as many bodies that are buried over in the section, especially section E all the way to the back, which is the smallest section in the entire cemetery. Might be no more than maybe a few hundred burials up in that section compared to say the thousands of burials over in section B and C, where, they, where you really see the entire overall casualties of the war. But what helps divide section D and E up from F and G is this little dirt road here, which is, if I recall correctly, a original wagon road that brought the bodies over to this entire section of the cemetery. And there's a small loop further up on that knoll where eventually they would just simply loop around, drop off the bodies, the bodies would then be taken and then find and then they would be buried in a subsequent grave and then they would just go back down this little dirt path here back onto the main road over here now there are a number of burials here that are somewhat notable but compared to section b and c it's only one notable grave and that would be 
a little bit further down towards that way, which I will show you in a bit. And here we have the grave of Willie B. W. Whitehurst, who died in, on June 23rd, 1862, at the young age of about 23. He was, of course, hospitalized in Shimbariso Hospital for typhoid fever. However, what makes him notable is that as we go around his tombstone quickly to show you the reverse, he's part of the Jackson Grays from Norfolk County, and he was a, a part of the Confederate Roll of Honor, which is a special award that was made during the war for Confederate for Confederate soldiers who showed true you know honor and valor in combat, very similar to the Medal of Honor actually, but for Southern men. Now we'll head on to Section F. And here we are at Section F of the cemetery, which is adjacent to Section D and E, which are on the opposite side of that same wagon road that I'd mentioned earlier. This section marks another trend of the war. This is now the 1864 section, or at least the start of the 1864 section. It continues on into section G, which is divided by this very faded but still kind of obvious wagon road that leads through towards all the way towards the end of section G down there. Now, as you can see over there, there's a tall little monument over there. That is a fairly recent monument that had been placed around, I think, 2008, which I'll show off in a few minutes. But also, there's a couple of unique little graves around here, such as, for example, one of the only grave in this entire section that uses that old stump style, which is itself not all that common, in most cemeteries. I'll go ahead and I'll show those off and then I'm going to go ahead and show the main con the new confederate monument off. This here is the grave of George T. Uh, Sorbera who is actually a much later burial compared to, to a lot of the 1864 burials in the cemetery. He was born in 1836 fought in the war. He was from Accomack County, Virginia, then it ended up here in Richmond until eventually his death in 1902, specifically August 27th, 1902, but ended up being buried here. Now, this is something that is quite unique because elsewhere in the entire section of the cemetery, I have not seen a grave of anyone past 1865 buried in this section. However, this is the only exception I could find. But this also shows the dedication of these old veterans to their fallen comrades who had died many decades ago and still chose to be buried here, much similar to a number of other burials that are actually across the street from the Confederate section who are largely Confederate veterans who decided to be buried here in Oakwood Cemetery in the civilian section, granted, next to the old confederate section and here we have the latest confederate monument here in the cemetery which is a monument that was erected in 2007 by the oakwood confederate cemetery trust which is which is a general monument of course which says here dedicated to the memory of the thousands of confederate soldiers who gave all gave their all, and who repose here known but to God. And the reason why this exists is because a lot of these burials here, a lot of them are identified, but a lot of them are also unidentified graves, which go on for a considerable distance. So in honor of those men who have fallen and whose names are unknown, we have this monument dedicated to them. Last, but certainly not least, we have Section G of Oakwood Cemetery, which is quite considerably one of the largest sections here. 
and it includes some of the other unique features of the cemetery, such as this speaking platform that was built later on, I believe in the 1930s, if I recall correctly, which is dedicated for the, like for the men who were lost here as well, and also serves as a podium for events that happen here every so often. Now, Section G covers really the last part of the war from the late, the early parts of 1864, so around May, June 1864, when the war finally returns to Richmond again, starting with the Battle of Cold Harbor, which happens essentially right outside the gates of Richmond and on the same battlefield as Gaines Mill, all the way through into the Siege of Petersburg and the Siege of Richmond, until the final catastrophic end on April 3rd, 1865, when the Confederate government finally abandons Richmond and then flees to the south towards Danville to set up a capital there. Now, what makes Section G quite unique is that it is largely these burials that happened later on the war. So you have burials from men who were wounded at Cold Harbor, from men who were wounded at the battles at, say, Chaffin's Farm, from places like that there, especially outside of the gates of Richmond, which is uh, one of the parts of the war that isn't really covered all that well compared to the Petersburg Campaign. And this section extends for quite a distance, all the way up towards that second little rise over there, where it finally ends where what is dubbed as the babies section of Oakwood Cemetery, which is where a lot of the infants of the city of Richmond were buried, especially those who weren't initially claimed. And this section, as you can see, is quite a considerable section. It goes on for a considerable distance. And there are a few notable burials, such as that one that's off in the distance, which I will actually cover shortly. But in the end, this entire section is possibly one of the largest sections of this entire cemetery. And though it has a large number of burials, a lot of them are unmarked, as you can see. There are a number that are, but a large portion of them aren't really well marked. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go all the way down there to check that final grave, that, you know, very elaborate grave over there, and then I'll conclude the video there. And here we have the grave of Lieutenant D.C. Stafford of the 8th South Carolina Volunteer Company I, who died July 23rd, 1864. Now his grave is quite a elaborate one compared to a lot of the other graves around here and actually has a nice little fine iron gate around it as well as a proper base for that iron gate, which compared to, say, most of the other burials here is a notable exception. But in the end, this is possibly a poignant example of the overall aspect of this entire war. The American Civil War was a truly bloody affair and resulted in thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives that were lost, which as you can see here with just this one grave is an example of the overall tragedy. After all, this is someone's son, someone's brother, even possibly someone's father. And it's important that when we come to these places, we treat them with respect and dignity. We should come here to honor them and remember them. Not to simply just gawk around and look at all these things and, in general, act like it's something, you know, odd and weird. After all, these are people's loved ones, and we should honor and respect them for that aspect. Because we never know if we will ever have to deal with whatever they've had to do. I pray to God every single day that I don't have to do this and have to sacrifice as they had. But if I have to, I will. And I will do so willingly, 
if I have to. But I pray that I do not have to. So, when you come here to Oakwood Cemetery, I think it's important that we come here and show a decent amount of respect. As you can see, this cemetery isn't the most well-kept compared to, say, oh, I don't know, Hollywood Cemetery further up here in Richmond, or, or some of the other cemeteries like uh, Shaco Hill, where a lot more, where a lot of important people are buried. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't care. We should come here and we should dedicate our time, even a few minutes of our day, to come here to just clean off one grave. To show that we still care about these men. And to show that we still care about their sacrifice. So, as I go over here and just show you the very end of this cemetery, this very end over here. I want to bid all of you a wonderful day, a blessed day, in fact, and may we remember these men for their honor and their valor. Have a wonderful day.